Just before we get started with today's video, I do want to mention another channel that I host called Business Blaze. It's about business, except it's really not. It delves into communist plots, crazy people from Florida, terrible social media campaigns, and pretty much whatever else Danny, the writer on that channel, decides that he has cobbled together for me that day. In a sense, Business Blaze is pretty much the exact opposite of biographics. I've thrown a good amount of silliness and fun at you along with some facts. People are so dumb. It's really remarkable. Oh, you are so dumb. There are also some premium grade A memes included, so check it out through the link below if you're feeling curious and in the mood for something different, and let's get into the video. To an artist, there is no greater degree of success than the mononym. Michelangelo, Basquiat, Madonna, to need only one name means that you are a legend in your field. You are more than just known, you are foundational. You are the blueprints that future generations build upon, even if you don't get your own Ninja Turtle. For most of his career, Rembrandt painted, frankly, rather unattractive people. In an age of Instagram filters, it's hard to see the appeal of looking at well, this. So, what made him famous in the first place, and why did he fall out of favor just as his fame was reaching its peak? The story of Rembrandt is rife with the same kind of drama he's captured on canvas. There's passionate romance, heart-wrenching tragedy, and a redemption arc that ultimately ends in betrayal. Buckle up, because today's episode is going to get a touch Shakespearean. One of ten children, born to father Harmon Gerritsoon van Rien and mother Nielsgen Wiltse Dota van... So oh, good lord. <laughs> Zutia broke, only six survived. Rembrandt Harmon Zoon van Rijn was number four, and he was chosen out of all of his siblings to attend Latin school. They were a family of millers, and van Rijn actually refers to the river that they lived next to, the Rhine. Rembrandt's education focused on biblical studies, as well as Greek and Roman classics. This clearly had a big impression on the young lads, because they would become the subjects of most of his celebrated works. However, the wonders of the ancient world failed to hold his attention quite as much as painting, and at the tender age of 14, he asked to study the craft at Leiden University. He apprenticed under two masters, Jacob van Swanberg and Peter Lastman. Van Swanenberg is best known for his paintings of hell, and here is where Rembrandt learned how to play with light and reflections. Lastman painted historical epics, the kind of paintings you think of when you see old important paintings. Naked people tangled up in sheets, startled horses, crumbling architecture, men with swords stabbing horses. People respected these pieces because it demanded a thorough knowledge of not just the human figure, but also landscapes, animal life, and ancient architecture. There's no way to hide any gaps in your own expertise. Either you know what you're doing, or you go down forever in history as the genius who painted a lion with sideburns. As of late 1625, Rembrandt settled in Leiden and began work as a guild-certified master of painting. His early work draws heavily from Blasman's historical work, though immediately Rembrandt sets out to experiment with the composition of not just the visual elements of the painting, but the physical composition of the paint itself. He painted fur and feathers by adding extra linseed oil to the pigment, making it thin, and applied it to the canvas with a brush holding only three or four bristles. Take a look at this wealthy fellow with the delicate feathers in his cap and the shiny Goiter around his neck. Even the scepter under his arm bespeaks a quiet, reserved aristocracy. At first glance, he might not look exceptionally wealthy, but to the upper crust of Amsterdam, subtle elegance was the mode of the day. What was once an unimpressive backwater had been transformed almost overnight into the country's foremost trading hub. Tobacco farmed on New World plantations arrived by the boatful along with fine silks and exciting new diseases, and, well, with that came money. The first patrons to support Rembrandt had grown up poor and suddenly experienced an explosion of wealth in Middle Age or later. They didn't lounge about in saloons or pubs. The church was their foremost social venue, so people had to master the art of the subtle flaunt or risk total damnation. Sumptuous furs, understated jewelry, delicate lacework and embroideries, these fine details were what his customers wanted, so he set out to showcase the art of expressing human expression. His etchings and sketches especially capture almost spontaneous moments of emotion, how the face crinkles during a laugh, the weight of sadness that accumulates in his mother's eye. Here is the artist who shows us as we are, not as we would have ourselves look honest and unstaged. 
He used the term natural liveliness to capture the kind of accidental, unrestrained motions normal to real life but absent from static images. He also took in some of his first students, including Gobert Fink, an ambitious history painter whose untimely death would play a part in Rembrandt's final humiliation, but we'll get to that later. Historians estimate that at least 50 individuals spent time with Rembrandt, which in part explains how many works have been falsely attributed to him. Though the official count now ranges between 300 and 350, the tally was once much higher. Google still claims 600 unique works to the master, but that's just not right, Google. He was famous for his self-portraits, scribbling off over 40 portraits and 37 etchings, leading some fairly desperate journalists to ask if he invented the selfie. Absolutely not, but let's take a look at an early example and see what made them so compelling to the public. Here we see the artist in his natural habitat. Look at the rough floors, the cracked plaster, the shabby clothes he worked in. Notice how small Rembrandt himself is compared to the foreground canvas. Every detail is meant to convey this noble simplicity, a dignified austerity rather than humiliating poverty. But look at this mysterious aura glowing from the canvas, intentionally turned away from the viewer. His eyebrows seem to be raised, but his expression is unreadable. He sees something we do not. He knows something that we can only guess at. The glow is heavy with possibility. Mysterious emanations of light are a recurring motif in Rembrandt's work, almost always representing some kind of divine blessing. No matter how you slice it, this is tantalizingly sassy. Here we have the perfect summary of his early career, because shortly after this he would begin experimenting with dramatic shadows. In 1630, Rembrandt unbrooted himself from the university town of Leiden and headed for the burgeoning metropolis of Amsterdam, where the money was just piling up. This was the start of the Dutch Golden Age, where crushing poverty and conflict was giving way to a burgeoning new passion for science and trade. A ceasefire in the Eighty Years' War had been negotiated a decade earlier. As the Dutch Republic had managed to establish itself, people were ready to start living large, Dutch style. He was already pulling in commissions from The Hague and selling to princes when he moved, so he had little trouble finding representation with the dealer Hendrik van Uhlenburg. The two shared accommodations, and three years later Rembrandt would marry Hendrik's cousin Saskia van Uhlenburg. As is generally the case with marrying an artist, her family had some reservations about the 29-year-old Rembrandt. Saskia's father had been a wealthy burgomaster and had left behind a considerable inheritance. Socially, she towered above him. He grew up in a mill house. She was the darling of the political class. Defying convention, she demanded a speedy betrothal, and in 1634 they were wed. None of Rem Rembrandt's family decided to show up, which is ominous, because it certainly didn't slow down the young couple. In 1639, they bought one of the most expensive houses on Jodenbriestraat, which, of course, you know as the Broadway of Amsterdam, and they filled it with art and uncomfortable fancy furniture. Rembrandt's career was red hot. Copies of his work were turning heads all across Europe, and he was cranking out more commissioned portraits than ever. Everything the kids touched turned to gold, and as we all know, once you're successful, nothing bad can ever happen to you again. Ever. So he started spending like his status depended on it. Obviously, it would be sacrilege for me to call one of the foremost European artists a gold digger. However, with his multiple incomes and Saskia's considerable inheritance, they could have paid off the mortgage with a handful of frugal years. Instead, Rembrandt hit the town, paying handsomely for imported Asian weapons, pretty rocks, and antiques, which sprawled throughout his impressive estate. Fun fact, it stops being a sensible business expense at the point where it impacts your ability to repay your debts. But we'll get back to that later. What impact did this sudden wealth have on his work? Earlier in the mid-1630s, Rembrandt had reinvented himself. He stopped signing his work R.H. and instead added the famous D to his first name. His work got physically darker, dominated by looming shadows punctuated by clusters of lighter shades. He called these clusters kindred colors, and it acts to draw focus like a flashlight on only the key details. In Artist in His Studio, the light was evenly distributed throughout the whole piece. The canvas and figure are given equal weight, only relative size indicates the scale of the room. Let's compare that to the Apostle Paul in prison, and immediately you can see the difference. The light envelops St. Paul, leaving the walls behind him in darkness. 
The parchment, along with the white shirt collars, draw our eyes to his hands and face. In the shadows next to him, tucked behind a stack of books, glints a formidable blade. We get the impression that the saint has abandoned the will to war and is instead investing himself in scripture. Here, light and focus are interchangeable. The details are illuminated in descending order of importance. We can read the whole image with just a glance before narrowing our attention onto the juicy bits. In 1639, Rembrandt was commissioned by cotton merchant and part-time militia captain Bannett Cox to produce a guardroom scene of his company, the Cloveniers, a sort of musketeer they trained in the use of the arquebus, which sounds more like architecture than a firearm, but it was a firearm. Rembrandt earned a cool 1,600 gold guilders for the commission, which he used to build an addition onto his house large enough to contain his massive canvas while he worked on it. To understand why this painting is so groundbreaking, let's put it in context. The war's front line was several thousand miles of ocean and a formal ceasefire away. None of these men were in any danger of actual fighting. These militias were funded by rich debutants in the same way that tech CEOs now buy by basketball teams. They weren't soldiers. In the likelihood that they ever had to face combat, they probably would have fled to their secondary homes in the country. It was just an excuse for society men to abandon their family empires for a weekend and drink with their mates in the woods. To commemorate their fun times together, they would commission portraits of themselves to hang in their fancy clubhouses. Here's an example of a traditional guardroom scene. Now, while these certainly look like two rows of soldiers polished up nice for a school photo, do they really feel like soldiers, or are they just well-groomed heads on top of nice clothes? Is soldier something you are, or is it something you do? Imagine that these dead and lifeless rugby lineups are what you expect art to look like, and then someone shows you this. Your expectations are absolutely shattered, the horizon of the possible widening beyond what the audience can imagine and swallowing them whole. This is what the artist does. They take the normal and they blow it up. It's important to stress how physically large this work is. The figures of the captain and lieutenant are as big as their real-life counterparts, and the only reason it currently measures 12 by 14 feet is because monsters cut off a bunch of the sides. Pictures cannot really capture the grand size of this thing. Here we have Captain Bannock, along with 18 of his loyal citizen soldiers, spilling out of the city gates ready for action. For ease of reference, I'm going to call this piece The Night Watch. The leap from guardroom prom photos to this action-packed movie poster is like the switch from listening to your grandpa's war stories as he falls asleep in an armchair to watching Apocalypse Now on IMAX. Nothing else in the gallery could even come close to the action, the movement, the sense that these soldiers were going to march right out of the frame and capture the snag table. This isn't just a picture of people being. These are men witnessed in in the midst of doing, and there was simply nothing else like it at the time. Arranging people side to side gives them a sense of equal weight and importance. Rembrandt flipped the script on that and framed his piece front to back, with the leaders clearly in the forefront, surrounded by a halo of their troops. The captain is flanked on both sides by glowing individuals, almost like parentheses in the edges and corners of the work, a busy and crowded darkness. Willem is a literal example of the Lancer, a TV tropes term for the second in command. He's clearly got that Lieutenant Riker swagger with his brilliant clothes and ornate weapon, the perfect image of a glorious soldier. The lance's blade is painted roughly to make it pop from the surface. Look how convincingly it's been foreshortened. The shadow seems to cover a portion of the bottom of the frame. You can imagine him lifting it aloft and shouting charge. But see how the shadow of the captain's hand falls over his clothes. The placement is a little salacious, but we don't need to dwell because the hand is actually holding a lion with a St. Andrew's cross, the city's emblem. The message is clear. The lieutenant does not outshine his commander. Every gesture, every detail conveys some significance about their relationship. In contrast, the captain's clothes are black, save for a brilliant sash of scarlet and a collar that helps frame his fearsome visage. The captain isn't concerned with the vanities of fashion. He needs his mind clear in order to safeguard his troops. But wait, is that a little girl? And she's got a dead chicken on her belt? Either she's out of place or war in the 17th century was much stranger than it is today. In actuality, this is Rembrandt engaging in a bit of Dan Brown-esque symbolism, a habit he would explore more heavily in his etchings. The claws of the chicken are taken from the Clovenier coat of arms, and the chicken itself is a pun on Koch's name. The Dutch word for Arquebus was Clauenier. In fact, bird claws are also present on the chain of the Amsterdam Company of Arquebuses, a trophy worn by the winner of that year's award. But she's also holding a goblet next to an oak leaf. Both images significant to the Cloveniers, clearly acting as 
a kind of battlefield mascot. Does the girl's face seem a little mature? That's because Rembrandt has hidden Saskia in there. So how did the public react? It's popular clickbait to state that the Night Watch was rejected and this collapsed Rembrandt's career, but the truth is a lot more complicated than that. Before we get to that fallout and why it definitely doesn't involve any secret murders, let's talk about the other issues in his life. In the midst of their dramatic rise in society, Saskia and Rembrandt tried multiple times to start a family. Only their fourth child, Titus, survived infancy. Shortly after his birth in September 1641, Saskia fell ill, probably with tuberculosis, and Rembrandt started having an affair with Gertie Dix, their maid. Saskia died on the 14th of June 1642, the same year the Night Watch was finally released. Plot twist, her will stipulated that Rembrandt would lose access to Titus's trust should he ever remarry. While still dallying with Gertie, started wearing Hendrik Stoffels, his second maid, who was also 20 years his junior. Outraged, Gertie sued for reneging on his promise to marry her. She pawned some of Saskia's jewelry, which Rembrandt had given to her, so he had her committed to an asylum. Then Hendrika was excommunicated from her church, and this all happened in just one house. Now you know why artists touch popular subjects for historical romances, the drama is apparently very juicy. The popular narrative claims that the Night Watch was rejected almost immediately, which combined with the tragic loss of Saskia and three of his children supposedly sent Rembrandt into a spiral of despair. On the contrary, there's no proof that the Night Watch was ever actually rejected. It hung in the Clovenier's clubhouse as intended. Now, it is true that he painted no portraits in the decade after, but he may have simply refused all commissions rather than not have been offered any in the first place. He focused on sketches and etchings instead. He did have to use legal measures to compel one subject, Andre de Schaaf, to pay, having to defend the merits of his work to a court of peers clearly irked him, as he used this episode as inspiration for a sketch depicting everyone involved as a group of arseared hooligans, while Rembrandt defiantly wiped himself with their opinion classy fellow. Obviously, a change took place, but the scale and emotional tenor had been exaggerated somewhat for the sake of a more compelling story. If there's any one external factor that hurt Rembrandt, it was the fruit of the Dutch Golden Age. The children of Rembrandt's original patrons had returned from their fancy international rich kid daycare schools, and they were ready to party. The peacock generation craved sensual experiences, rich foods, glitzy clothes, loud parties, and they rebelled against every aspect of their parents' stoic simplicity. They wanted nothing to do with Rembrandt's saggy cheeks and oppressive shadows. That was no way for a princess to look. They imported the nascent classical movement from France, which suddenly made Rembrandt's stodgy realism seem all the more drab. He didn't become unpopular, he just became unfashionable. His work was considered praised up until his death, even if it didn't keep up with the trends. Another misattributed detail of his legacy concerns the so-called Rembrandt Brown, an almost gauzy earth tone present over much of his work. Most of that is varnish added after his death in order to smooth out the effect of impasto, thickly applied paint that manipulates the play of light on the surface. Varnishing flattens the effect, making the work readable at a wider range of distance, the kind of thing you might care about if you were a gallery owner trying to get the most eyes on the work as possible. The Night Watch suffered the most. Initially, it was a daylight scene, but the thick varnish blotted out much of the color. History automatically isn't brown and grimy. Some museum curators simply chose to ice skate uphill. At one point in history, it was so heavily varnished that it successfully deflected a knife attack. The ultimate truth of his fall lies not in some existential crisis inflicted by the loss of his wife, but rather the fact that he was difficult to work with. His contemporaries joked that he would not interrupt his painting to meet with a prince, and no matter how respected an artist you are, having that kind of precious attitude is going to cost you. Talent can elevate you to the upper echelons of society, but cannot compel power to kneel. In every endeavor, if you are unlikable, your prospects will suffer. The antisocial geniuses too important to bother with social niceties tend to only be appreciated after their deaths because no one can abide their company while living. Talented, wealthy jerk. You tend to only get to pick two. On top of his train wreck of a personal life, debts and spending continued to dog him until he died. On July 15, 1656, he declared bankruptcy. Adding insult to injury, the Chamber of Insolvency, where he made his case, had a doorway crowned with a marble carving of rats crawling out of an empty money box. His house and possessions were sold at auction, but they failed to fully cover what he owed. The only surviving piece of furniture, a huge mirror in an ebony frame, broke en route to the new house. Even after downsizing to a modest cottage, his obsessive collections would again grow to fill two large rooms 
dreams. His bankruptcy stripped him of his guild membership and the ability to work as a master artist, so he only managed to continue painting by setting up a dummy corporation wherein he was the sole employee. To add insult to injury, he was technically owned by his then lover Hendricki and son Titus. So how did a man with Rembrandt's ego cope? Why, two years later he painted himself dressed like a king, and well, you've just got to respect that move. One of the most consistent themes of Rembrandt's later works is how he blurred the line between finished painting and sketch. Rembrandt knew how limited the cone of visual focus really is, and how much detail the human mind fills in around it. At the distance his paintings are seen, he knows exactly where he has to place the fine brush strokes, and where he can let us do the work for him. He was very touchy about letting people get too close to the work, because he knew the effect would be ruined. He often joked about the offensive smell of the paint, but that didn't stop him from cleaning the brushes on the coat that he was wearing. Perhaps the perfect example comes from this painting of Hendrik Stoffels. When taken as a whole, it looks like a normal complete painting. Maybe a little on the saucy side with those bare thighs and plunging neckline, but you wouldn't call this unfinished, would you? Let's zoom in on her hands, though. I mean, what happens here? It looks like she tried boxing a meat grinder. Her thumb is a single brush stroke. Compare that to where her leg enters the water and the reflection it casts below her. Look how fine the detail is. When his critics claim his work is incomplete, they're pointing to contrasts like this. But if the artist decides it's finished, why does it matter that they've left the unimportant details rough and cursory? The hands clearly aren't the point of the picture. We don't need to see every branch and leaf in the foliage behind her because they're not relevant. It's not a portrait of a river, it's a portrait of someone bathing. The dirty old man wanted to paint his new flame in an intimate moment, and from this we got a work of immense genius. While we know him now primarily for his paintings, they never left the Netherlands in his lifetime, and he is one of the few master artists who never studied outside the country of birth. In life, his international reputation was built almost entirely from his line work, producing over 300 etchings and over a thousand sketches. To this day, he is considered one of the foremost masters of etching, having invented new ways of playing with line, shape, and thickness, even the physical composition of the resin he etched into. Every aspect of his craft was done with intent, always prodding at the absolute limit of his tools. He would work on the same print for years at a time, releasing drafts even as he continued to make sweeping changes to the composition. Bankruptcy put an end to his etchings, though in a mysterious twist, none of his tools or originals were sold at auction. They simply vanished, perhaps sold earlier on the sly or given to a friend for safekeeping. Either way, the majority of the plates had been destroyed or lost by the time of his death, though 82 have since been rediscovered. Remember Govert Fink, one of Rembrandt's early students? He had gone on to establish a respectable career, producing technically competent histories and portraits, his life relatively free of conflict or strife. He was commissioned to paint a series of 12 canvases for Amsterdam's new town hall, a mix of biblical stories and scenes of mythologized Dutch history. After completing a set of preliminary sketches, he died suddenly and the commissions were divided between his contemporaries. Despite being out of favor with the elites, Rembrandt was chosen to depict the conspiracy of Claudius Civilis, where a former Roman and soldier united the disparate tribes and drove the Roman army out of the Rhine. It's a story intimately familiar to the entire country, marking the birth of the Dutch identity. Nascent liberation from Spanish rule added an extra layer of significance to the story, which was experiencing a popular resurgence at the time. It's like King Arthur, but real. That's how important the story was to Rembrandt's audience. So, of course, he was going to play it safe and not offend anyone. Right? That's certainly what the Burgomaster assumed. Here's how Otto van Veen painted the scene in 1613. It's technically competent, but conceptually bereft. There's no surprise, no shock of the new. It wouldn't be out of place in a textbook. Here's Rembrandt's version looking like an early Magic the Gathering card. Never before had Civilis's empty socket been depicted so centrally. Until then, the tradition was to only show him from the side. And the soldiers surrounding him were grizzled and haggard like real soldiers. These weren't the enlightened philosophers who would usher forth a united nation. These were flea-bitten murderers used to sleeping in a saddle. The sword oath was a detail invented by Rembrandt himself. See how the light seems to bubble up from the painting itself. It hung but briefly before being returned, with a vague request to make it more presentable. He probably wasn't ever paid for the work, commissions on a custom curved canvas measuring over 30 square feet. Instead, he cut out the heart, slapped it in a smaller frame, and tried to mark it just the central bit. Four-fifths had been lost to time, save for the enigmatic sketch on the back of a funeral invitation. An outsider was hired to complete Fink's sketch to hang in its place, and 
slapped together a replacement in four days. Rembrandt was unable to find a buyer and set up to sell Saskia's grave. His chance at a comeback came and went. Hendrika died in 1663, Titus went in 1668, and his father followed one year later. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe, and thank you for watching. Thank you.